One of the questions I get asked a lot is whether I support terrain theory. Like most doctors, I was trained to focus on germ theory. In fact, terrain theory was not something I recall ever being mentioned in medical school or on the hospital rounds when I first started practicing. However, in early 2020, when the corona narrative started making less and less sense to me, I realized that germ theory had some major inconsistencies. I did my own research and my journey led me to the Virus Mania team and a paradigm shift in my thinking. This video will be a broad overview of the two schools of thought and whether we can learn something from both. Firstly, you might ask, why is it important whether people believe in germ theory or terrain theory? Shouldn't people just be able to make up their own minds? Definitely. On a philosophical and spiritual level, I'm completely at peace with that and it's the best way to keep a healthy discussion going. However, as should have been apparent by the year 2020, germ theory has captured the minds of much of the medical industry and policy makers, while terrain theory gets pushed to the side. In Virus Mania, we state that the pharmaceutical companies and top scientists rake in enormous sums of money by attacking germs, and the media boosts its audience ratings and circulations with sensationalized reporting. Individuals pay the highest price of all without getting what they deserve and need most to maintain health. Enlightenment about the real causes and true necessities for prevention and cure of their illnesses. So what is germ theory and how did it come about? In the middle of the 19th century, there were incredible advances in hard sciences such as chemistry and physics, and it put the population under a spell with these new descriptions of very specific phenomena. Unfortunately, this thought pattern of specificity, that very particular chemical or physical phenomena have very specific causes, was simply transferred to the medical sciences. It seems that for many scientists, very little thought was given as to whether it was valid to apply these theories to a completely different field. Germ theory states that pathogenic microorganisms invade hosts, such as humans, where they multiply and cause a specific disease, which may then be transmissible to other hosts. The dogma of a single cause for disease was decisively shaped by microbiology, which became predominant at the end of the 19th century, with proponents such as Louis Pasteur declaring specific microorganisms to be the sole cause of very definite diseases. As American sociology professor Stephen Epstein has written with regards to the microbe theory, the cornerstone was laid for modern biomedicine's basic formula with its monocausal microbial starting point and its search for magic bullets. One disease, one cause, one cure. Now if we go to trusty old Wikipedia, the germ theory of disease page states that it is the currently accepted scientific theory for many diseases. However, curiously, the page has no criticism section, but at the bottom of the page there is a link to Wikipedia's germ theory denialism page. Well, as we know, the term denialism usually means someone probably doesn't want you looking into this. Amusingly, on the germ theory page, they include Cox postulates as evidence, but this is quickly followed by the excuses that you don't really need to fulfill the postulates to satisfy germ theory. I guess that's when the attempts to infect healthy hosts or demonstrate transmissibility of diseases completely failed, or when many of Pasteur's experiments were later found to be fraudulent. Anyway, the debate about whether germ theory is a satisfactory explanation for disease has been going on for quite some time. The following piece by Professor H.C. Bastian appeared in the British Medical Journal in 1875, where he raised his concerns about the rising acceptance of germ theory. Keep in mind that this was written over 130 years ago, so the science was at a much earlier stage. However, there was already enough knowledge for Bastian to point out that the alleged causes of disease, microorganisms, may be actually introduced into the blood vessels of lower animals by thousands without producing any deleterious effects in a large proportion of the cases. Bacteria, if not actually to be found within the blood vessels of healthy persons, do nevertheless habitually exist in so many parts of the body in every human being and in so many of the lower animals as to make it almost inconceivable that these organisms can be causes of disease. 
bacteria are the creatures of circumstance and modifiable to an extraordinary degree. The last position is even admitted by Professors Sanderson and Lister. The former acknowledges that they are the lowest organisms and that they are much more under the influence of the conditions under which they originate and are developed than organisms of any other class. In his paper, you'll note that Bastian never denies the association of bacteria and diseased tissue. However, he states that this condition does not come about by bacteria invading healthy tissue and causing disease. On the contrary, the tissue is already unhealthy and the changed conditions allow the bacteria to take the upper hand, but they certainly don't instigate the disease themselves. At the time of birth, we can see that the germ theory already runs into a bit of a problem. Just a few hours after arrival, all of a newborn baby's mucous membranes have already been colonized by bacteria, which perform important protective functions. Without these colonies of billions of germs, the infant, just like the adult, could not survive. But key proponents of germ theory, such as Louis Pasteur, believed that bacteria should not be found in a perfectly healthy body, and that microbes floating through the air were responsible for diseases. Flaws in Pasteur's theories were shown long ago in the first half of the 20th century by experiments in which animals were kept completely germ-free. Their birth even took place by caesarean section, and then they were locked in microbe-free cages and given sterile food. After a few days, all the animals were dead. So we have a situation where billions of microbes are inside us and all over us and have been proven to be essential for life. A team led by Jeremy Nicholson remarked in 2004 that humans can be considered superorganisms with an internal ecosystem of diverse symbiotic microbiota and parasites that have interactive metabolic processes. Additionally, our gut is estimated to contain around one kilogram or over two pounds of microorganisms. It makes you wonder how much of a healthy human body is human and how much is foreign. Maybe these terms are not actually appropriate at all. And that's why we have another much less known way of thinking, known as terrain theory. Microbes are found in an environment, or terrain, and the microbe is nothing. The terrain is everything, is the phrase attributed to Claude Bernard, one of the best known representatives of a holistic approach to health. Terrain theory, which is also known as cellular theory, holds that the body provides the environment or terrain for microorganisms. If the body is healthy, it remains in balance with the microorganisms that colonize it. If the body is compromised, those same microorganisms respond to the environmental changes and cause what we know as disease, but they are not invasive or transmissible in the sense of germ theory. When I worked on the surgical wards, one of the most difficult things to treat were skin ulcers which formed due to compromised blood flow, particularly in the lower leg. Now frequently they would become infected and we would take swabs of the tissue to see which bugs the lab could identify. Much of the time they would find Staphylococcus aureus and perhaps some antibiotic treatment would be prescribed. However, Staphylococcus aureus is found on the skin of many people and most of the time it has no negative effects for them at all. The bacteria does not prey on healthy humans as such. It only becomes a problem when the person's terrain is already compromised. In the case of ulcers, the skin is dying and the already present microbes detect the new conditions, change their function and proliferate. As general practitioner Johan Leubner says, under close observation of disease progression, particularly in infected processes, damage to the organism occurs at the beginning of the disease, and only afterwards the bacterial activity begins. Everyone can observe this in himself. If we put dirt into a fresh wound, other bacteria appear as well. After the penetration of a foreign body, very specific germs appear which, after removal or release, go away on their own and do not continue to populate us. If we damage our respiratory mucous membranes through hypothermia, then those bacteria accordingly appear, which depending on the hypothermia's acuteness and length and the affected individual's condition, can break down the affected cells and lead to expulsion. Qatar. 
You may have heard the medical term opportunistic infection, which usually refers to an infection that develops because of a weakened immune system, for example, due to malnutrition, excessive stress, a disrupted microbiome, steroid administration, and chemotherapy. However, this seems to be a concession to terrain theory. Indeed, I've not been able to establish where the definition of opportunistic infection actually starts and finishes. Terrain theorists would argue that every infection is opportunistic, and thus the term is redundant. I searched to find the origins of the term opportunistic, and the Oxford English Dictionary lists this 1955 paper in Scientific American, Second Thoughts on the Germ Theory, as its earliest example in medical literature. Microbiologist and humanist René Debeau wrote, Was it not possible, they argued, that bacteria were only the secondary cause of disease? Opportunistic invaders of tissues already weakened by crumbling defences. Interestingly, Debeau positions himself somewhere between germ and terrain theory, and in the article states, a new look at the biological formulation of the germ theory seems warranted. Something most doctors today won't realise when using the term is that Debeau coined the term opportunistic when describing terrain theory. That's all very well, you might say, but surely we should be scared of some dangerous microorganisms. Definitely, you don't want parasitic protozoans such as the ones associated with malaria in your blood, but as that results from an insect bite, it bypasses our usual systems and is not the typical way we encounter microbes. In day-to-day -day life in developed countries, I think there is very little to worry about in terms of predatory microbes. They don't jump out at healthy people unexpectedly. In this sense, I think that pathogenic microbes are the exception rather than the rule. Every day we breathe in and swallow all sorts of microbes and no illness results from it. There are deadly diseases such as anthrax where the spores of the bacillus can be fatal if inhaled, but at about one or two cases per year in the US, this could hardly be considered a significant health issue. Outside of weaponized anthrax made by unnaturally concentrating the spores, it makes you suspect that in nature, many people inhale the spores without getting sick. Additionally, anthrax is not contagious in that an infected person cannot usually pass it on to others. Essentially, if you have good nutrition, normal body weight, clean water, and a non-polluted environment, microbes are your friends rather than foes. So, there you have it, a brief overview of germ theory and terrain theory. Over to you for your thoughts and keeping the conversation going in the comments. I found that you can learn a lot reading material from both schools of thought, but as we outline in Virus Mania, germ theory has spun out of control due to misplaced fears about microbes and the vested interests from the medical pharmaceutical industrial complex. Personally, I suspect that focusing on germ theory can lead people to be fearful and anxious with a habit of externalizing their health and a view that medicine must fix them. They worry about catching disease from others and can even advocate coercive measures against fellow humans who they perceive as threats. On the other hand, I find terrain theory advocates to be more at peace with the environment in a belief that they themselves are the key to their health. They don't have much faith in putting many pharmaceuticals in their body and focus more on aspects such as nutritional and spiritual well-being. You may have seen a meme in circulation that I find effective on several levels. Obviously, it's about physical health, but I think it also encapsulates the psychological and social themes I've just mentioned. I wonder, from a psychological perspective, if Jordan Peterson would agree that cleaning the tank, or as he would say, cleaning your room, has benefits beyond that which are immediately apparent. Maybe the result is helpful on multiple levels of health. In any case, I'm going to keep my tank, or at least my room, clean. <laughs> I'd like to finish with a quote from Antoine Bichon, who is often considered as Louis Pasteur's chief rival of that era. Unfortunately for Bichon, his ideas and philosophy were not useful for political players in the nascent drug industry, so unlike Pasteur, he doesn't get a mention in most textbooks. However, his spirit reaches us today in these immortalized words. Nothing is lost, nothing is created, all is transformed. Nothing is the prey of death, all is the prey of life.
On another note, thank you to those of you who have recently purchased Virus Mania. In New Zealand, we have been selling them like hotcakes and unfortunately I'm only down to my last three books and the top one's mine. So <laughs> uh, if you want another one, please let me know. I'll let you know in the description below how to contact me uh, and there'll be about a two week waiting list for new orders. To help sustain my channel in this time of censorship, please support my work on Subscribestar. Link is in the description.